Rutgers and got his PhD in Stanford. And now he is a professor at Johns Hopkins. Um, he has been interested in uh, large ensembles of uh, uh, emergent phenomena of large ensembles of strongly interacting particles, but with simple particles. Now today he will talk about the uh, electrodynamics of quantum correlated matrix. Okay. That's welcome. Okay, thank, thank you very much. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here at the Princeton Summer School. Uh, I was here a few years ago, I think, and uh, um, it's, uh, you know, it's always interesting to see people who you talk to at summer schools and met at summer schools go on to, to do great things a few years down the road. So I look forward to seeing you guys in a different context in some conferences uh, from you, some years from now. So uh, the, the, in content and in tone, the, the lecture today, and my lecture, is going to be a little bit different than, uh, than Gill's uh, just, just before. I would say it's going to be much less focused. I'm going to be generally talking about the use of light to look at materials. Um, I'm going to start at various points. I'm going to discuss really, really basic things. It's, I think uh, it's, uh, it's the, the nature and the tenor of our times that uh, things perhaps like various phase and various connection don't have to be introduced in detail, but things, let's say, like uh, Kubo formalism or even the Druda model, uh, simplest uh, model for dynamics in a, of electrons, electrons we can imagine. Um, does need to be introduced. So I'm going to talk about some very simple things. At some point, I'm going to talk about the optical spectra of gold and lead. Uh, it's plain old silicon. And then we're also going to talk about more kind of complicated um, and more interesting uh, topical materials from there. Um, one thing just to point out, I think you probably got the, the emails about it, but I have some lecture notes that I kind of, uh, let's say, intermittently update as, uh, as the, uh, you know, when I, when I give um, lectures in summer schools. And so these were first done for the Boulder School in 2008. And uh, this summer, it turns out, I'm, I'm lecturing in two summer schools on the same topic, optics of uh, correlated or, or quantum systems. And so you can find these lecture notes on the, on the archive. And uh, I intermittently update them as uh, decide I want to put various different things in them. But mostly, uh, everything I talk about today uh, will be is is in here in these notes. They're some 50 pages long, so obviously I won't get through everything. My lecture tomorrow is going to be a little bit, let's say, on uh, a more topical uh, uh, subject, and that is uh, kind of reviewing in a pedagogical approach our recent measurements, looking at the uh, quantized magneto electric effect in topological insulators. So you can think of today as a very very long introduction to the uh, to the basically getting you ready ready for that. But I'm going to talk in general about the optical response of solids. So um, in general, when we're talking about physic, physical systems, the, uh, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that everything we can basically learn about them comes from their response to finite frequency perturbations. So whether you're talking about a mass on a spring, uh, an atom, a violin string, or whatever is displayed here at the bottom, in all cases, we can learn about these physical systems by the response to finite frequency perturbations. So you shake a physical system at some frequencies and see what its resonance frequencies are. I mean, this is an intuitive thing to human beings, right? You give a small child a present, and you say that they're not allowed to open it yet, find out what's inside, but what do they do? They shake it. And they just think that they're trying to figure out if it's something soft or hard inside, but really what they're doing is trying to find the normal modes of such a system. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to find out if they're overdamped or not, to find out if it's a, you know, some little stuffed animal or a, or a toy car if you will. Um, so I mean, this is a generic kind of thing. And at some level, what, we, what I do in my laboratory, which is optical experiments of solids, uh, we're doing basically just the same thing. Um, very frequently, because many of the systems that we're, uh, we're interested in dealing with, say when we're dealing with electrons, have knobs. You know, An electron has both a charge knob on it. We can manipulate it with electric fields. Or it has a spin. We can manipulate it with magnetic fields. Right, light, the response of subsystems to light. So driving them at their finite frequencies is, uh, uh, with light is, uh, t tends to be useful. The um, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, okay, it, uh, of course, is infinitely large. And uh, there are just some relevant kind of, if you will, spatial scales here and, uh, uh, and energy scales and frequency scales. Of course, visible, which we actually use, which our eyes are sensitive to, is an itty-bitty uh, bit of the middle here. And, um, uh, but we're going to be concerned with many, many different frequencies in this range. The, one of the problems in this field in general, I would say, is that uh, different kinds of spectroscopies all use different units. 
And so you'll even hear me today in the lecture banding around different kinds of units. One thing that I typically keep in mind, and you can kind of, if you will, commit to memory, that uh, 200 gigahertz is approximately equal to 10 degrees Kelvin, which is approximately equal to 1 milliV, which is approximately equal to 10 inverse, uh, 10 wave numbers, which uh, is inverse centimeters, which is a unit that uh, many infrared spectroscopists use. And this is, uh, let's say, accurate to units of pi over E, and gives you some rough feeling for the relevant scales of things. So uh, I'm going to use both the board and, where's chalk? Here's chalk. I'm going to use both the board and these notes. So the, the energy scales of solids run just some you know, ridiculously large range. And this means that there are certain challenges when it comes to being an experimentalist who's interested in probing the physics of solids. And so let's say starting at the highest energy range and using, using units of electron volts, they say something around 10 electron volts to 10 kilo electron volts is the energy scale of typical chemical bonding. Okay. So um, you can kind of cons compare some of these energy scales as we go here with this sky scales here. So this is 10 kilo electron volts, and you're talking about you know, light, which has a wavelength, let's say, of a, of a virus, typical virus. OK, so uh, coming down in energy scales, let's say from a half an electron volt to 10 electron volts. And of course, this is by no means uh, some exhaustive list, but this is just kind of things which come to mind. This would say in some, let's say, transition metal oxide is the on-site Coulomb uh, interaction energy. We typically call it U. And, uh, and also, typically, let's say, the nearest neighbor hopping energies in many solids. some kind of tight binding sense. Right? So what we typically call this guy T. Right? And so this is, of course, why many transition metal oxides have withstood uh, our uh, uh, extended gaze for the last 70, 80, 90 years. And in particular, in the last 30 years is because the energy scales of the interactions are approximately the energy scales of the kinetic energy. Okay, uh, okay good. So moving onward. Um, Let's say talking about energy scales on the range from, say, well, let's start at zero, but then to about a half an electron volt. This is the energy scales generally of, say, collective magnetic modes. So if it's an ordered system, we call these magnons or spin waves. Um, if we go to lower energy scales, say to about a tenth of an electron volt. These are like the collective lattice modes of solids. Right? And we call those phonons. Say energy is roughly, let's say, something around 50 milli electron volts. This is the superconducting gap in coupe rates. Um, always keep good in keep keep in mind other things. Say twenty five milli eV is approximately room temperature. Okay, which sets a good energy window possibly for doing experiments. We might be interested, let's say, in something like quantum critical phenomena. And there, in such systems, when you have near quantum phase transition, the only relevant energy scale is the temperature itself. And so let's say you're at some low temperature, you know, let's say 10 degrees Kelvin. So that's 1 30th of room temperature. And so you're talking about a milli electron volt or so for setting the temperature scale of that phenomenon. So 25 milliV is a good energy scale to keep in mind. And uh, even if you're a theorist and you don't particularly care about, uh, you know, some field theorist and you only you don't particularly care about the actual energy scales of things, it's always good to have these energy. If you're going to be a condensed matter physicist, it's good to have these energy scales in mind because you'll go to talks and you want to have some, you know, rough idea of what kinds of energy scales that the spectroscopist may be uh, talking about. Okay, so uh, going onward, say one milli electron volt to 10 milli electron volts. 
This is approximately, let's say, the scattering rate of, the electro of electrons in clean metals. And I'm just being, it's a scattering rate, although I've co quoted it in units of energy, so we're just assuming that I can multiply or divide by Planck's constant as, as I will. Um, let's say, can you see this here? Probably not. I should go back to the, I can do this. This, yeah, I'll do it like that for now. Okay. Say uh, 0 0.1 milliEV to say, zero, say about 5 milliEV. That's the superconducting gap. In conventional superconductors, let's say, like niobium or lead, which, uh, or aluminum, uh, which we think you know, are reasonably well understood. But of course, this is the energy scales that are, uh, these are the materials which are used in many of these kinds of interesting composite superconducting systems, like the, tup the topological nanowires that we were just hearing about. Right? So important to keep this in mind. And uh, finally, let's put in as another ener final energy scale here, something, let's say, 0 0.01 milliEV, which is the scattering rate in um, heavy fermion systems. Okay, so we're going to talk about those as examples of material systems where correlation effects are really kind of at their strongest, if you will, and in such systems like this, one of the remarkable and amazing things is that a free electron description or free charge description of such systems is still valid with some caveats that we have to imagine, for instance, that the effects of interactions are all buried in renormalizing effects on these free charge parameters, say for instance, like the mass. So in a free heavy fermion system, the mass of the fermions moving along can be something like a thousand times the free electron mass. So almost the mass of a proton. Okay, so um, we're gonna consider uh, various different experiments that can measure all of these kinds of energy scales and just, you know, this obscene uh, large relevant scales all the way down from the 10 kilo electron volt range down to the 10 micro electron volt range means that no single one experiment is going to be able to capture all of them. So your task as a spectroscopist is experimental spectroscopist is really to go and look at some particular physical system, ask yourself what questions you want to answer, and then use the appropriate technique. My lab, in general, kind of concentrates, if you will, on the low frequency end of these things. But this means that if we're interested in problems, let's say, uh, that are associated with, you know, ma insulators, where the interaction energies in the order of a few electron volts, still very, very interesting fundamental aspects of this are just not understood in terms of the optical response of mod insulators, you know, we're not working on this so much. My interest and my focus has generally been on low frequency spectroscopic response of solids, and so we use things like microwave and terahertz spectroscopy. So we're gonna come back and talk about this. Um, generally today, I'm gonna to mostly talk about experiments that determine things like the complex conductivity or the complex dielectric function. So where we were talking about the optical response in the, from the linear response limit of the uh, interaction of light with materials, um, but I'll talk a little bit at the end today, hopefully, about nonlinear response, which is a really kind of burgeoning field with lots of very, very interesting things going on. The other caveat I would say is uh, throughout is um, we're gonna use, I'm gonna use the language, generally speaking, of non-interacting electrons and describing most results. Um, and it's not at all clear that this is a you know, particularly good language to use at all. We don't have anything better for the most part, so that's what we do. But it's not at all clear, of course, you know, at the beginning that 10 to the fourth electrons per cubic centimeter the kind of elementary excitations of such, such a systems should be anything at all like, let's say, the free electron response. So this is gonna be an assumption. Um, this can be formalized in various different ways. We're not gonna talk about that so much. We're generally just gonna use this language of non-interacting electrons. Again, possibly with some caveats of things like dramatically renormalized masses, but, um, but uh, one would naively expect that the elementary excitations of such systems are gonna be anything like those are the free electron response. You might think 
you know, generically, they're going to be things like plasmonic excitations, you know, kind of large composite multi-particle objects of systems. Um, the miracle is, of course, that uh, that uh, uh, quasi-free electron point of view works in many uh, cases. And in fact, for what we're going to talk about, things like Berry's phase or topological materials, really the field has not progressed much at this point in the terms of um, three-dimensional systems much beyond the language of, of, of quasi-free uh, particles or, or free electrons. Um, again, we're going to use the language of, uh, of free particles and uh, particularly free electrons, but you always have to kind of keep in mind that using this language can prejudice the kinds of questions you ask about experiments. Even just using words like density of states or effective mass or scattering rate, poly susceptibility, electron phonon coupling, all of these kinds of words themselves assume the existence of free electrons to you know, even make the definition of these words uh, mean anything at all. Uh, okay, so such language obviously is inappropriate if, if these kind of, if you will, interactions are strong enough such that these elementary excitations are not electron free. Okay, um, good. And as we go, if there are questions, please. Any questions so far? Good. So, uh, okay, good, let's go on. So, um, Okay, so the starting point here is something that everybody knows, of course, is Maxwell's equations up there in the upper left. And uh, generally, if you're talking about the response of electromagnetic waves with solids, you have to supplement your naive Maxwell's equations by what we call these uh, auxiliary equations with these auxiliary fields that are typically called D and H. And of course, there's also polarization and magnetization. Um, uh, which modify the Maxwell's equations in this kind of essential form. The quantities of interest typically for us are going to be things like the susceptibility, which is defined in this fashion, the magnetization or the conductivity. These quantities are, you can see, it's all written in the limit of linear response. There's a linear proportionality between the field that's applied and the response that comes out. And uh, things, for instance, like the conductivity is just the proportionality between a current and the applied electric field. These can be written generically as such, but they can be quantities where the electric field could be, let's say, uh, applied at finite frequency. That's what happens, of course, in all of our experiments. And then these quantities like the susceptibility or the conductivity can generically be complex quantities. We can also define things in terms of, in terms of susceptibilities, in terms of things like dielectric functions or magnetic permittivities that can be, uh, that can be, explained, uh, that can be uh, defined in this fashion. Okay, so let's one. So I'm going to talk a little bit generically about these response functions to kind of set up the stuff that we'll talk about later on, and then I'm going to get into a bunch of different examples. Okay, so uh, generally we start by defining things in the time domain. So for instance, we can write down a function for the polarization as a function of time that can be written in this fashion here, say in terms of some susceptibility. So we could write polarization in terms in the time domain as a convolution of the electric field with the susceptibility in this fashion, um, or the, conducti the conductivity comes out as looking at the current again by this definition. here written in the time domain, they're called memory functions for perhaps obvious reasons. Um, these can be written down in the limit of linear response and what we call the dipole approximation. 
Um, typically, that what that means is that the wavelength of the, the light that we're using is uh, long as compared to relevant scales, you know, of, let's say, of the lattice or the kind of the, the intrinsic scales of the excitations themselves. Um, an important principle here is the principle of causality, uh, meaning that effects can't precede their causes. And in fact, you'll see that the kind of the temporal considerations of this time integral is such that, you know, at a, knowing the polarization at some time t depends upon all earlier times, but obviously doesn't depend upon times that come after t. Right? So this sounds like a triviality, but it's going to be important. Um, generally speaking, we're going to be concerned not with the spatial dependencies here at all. Okay, light, as you recall from the slide I put up, is has a generally a very, very long wavelength compared to kinds of scales that we'd be interested in, right? Even at the uh, multi-electron volt range, we're still talking about wavelengths on the order of viruses, right? How many atoms does a virus have in it? I have no idea, but it's got a lot. And so that means, you know, the relevant kind of uh, size scales, kind of the, the for, for many things, the, the relevant, um, if you will, minimum size scale that we're going to be interested in is kind of the interatomic distances. So what this means is that the wavelengths are essentially infinite on all length scales of interest. If we're making some kind of heterostructure or a nanowire that you might want to scan in some fashion, then spatial dependencies can be important. But generally, for the, you know, thinking about these response functions, they're not. And so what it means is that we're generally going to be able to take the zero momentum limit. Okay? So um, this causal requirement that the effects cannot um, uh, precede their causes gives uh, a series of relations that we call the kramers kronig relations, which are incredibly powerful. Um, uh, the typical derivation of them, where we go, we would take these expressions here in the time domain, we put them into the frequency domain, and then the derivation on them rests on the assumption of analyticity in the complex plane and appealing to be able to do these integrals using Cauchy's theorem. I never quite found that this was uh, particularly intuitive. The whole point of, you know, kind of starting from causality means that, uh, you know, this is, a, this is kind of a, an obvious thing. It's an assumption. It's a statement about our world itself. And then immediately kind of uh, diving into mathematical formalism. Uh, never really did much for me in that regard. So uh, I want to give you an alternative derivation of this, which I find much more intuitive. Um, and we're going to talk about the uh, <coughs> use of the kramers koenig relations, which are going to be important for various things like sum rules that we're going to use, as well as, um, um, as, well as analysis of the, the complex conductivity data itself. OK, so let's start with expression for the frequency dependent conductivity in terms of looking at its, let's say, Fourier transform. All right. OK, so that's just the Fourier transform of, uh, of this memory function of the conductivity t, okay, which I had already defined down there. OK, so causality mandates that the conductivity for times less than 0, as defined here, is equal to 0. Okay, the conductivity defined in the time domain, right? so for how this guy is written. And hence, we can take this expression for the conductivity. And we can write, I'm sorry, I have to, I'm going to keep running out of board here. So I'm just going to go to the other side. I can do it from here. OK. So we can write. that because of this consideration of the memory function of conductivity is 0 for negative times, then it doesn't make any difference if we integrate it from minus infinity to infinity or from 0 to infinity. And we can write the conductivity in this particular fashion. But it also 
We could write it in terms of infinity to minus infinity, where we include heavy side step function in this fashion. Okay? So h of t is just the heavy side function. Heavy side function is zero for times less than uh, zero and one for times uh, greater than zero. Okay, good, right? So uh, just to review what we've done here, we've taken just the definition for the Fourier transform. We uh, have uh, made the reasonable physical assumption that for uh, that that uh, causes uh, have to come before their effects. And uh, which means that uh, the conductivity itself can't depend on negative times. That's what means it's okay if we integrate from zero to infinity. And here um, we can do basically achieve exactly the same thing by taking the doing the integral from minus infinity to, to infinity, but multiplying by the heavy side step function. Okay. Now we can use if one is has a quantity that one is taking. The Fourier transform of, and that quantity can be written in terms of being multiplied by two quantities. We have the convolution theorem, these two quantities being multiplied, and we're taking the Fourier transform of it. The convolution theorem says that I can find, if I have either of these quantities, therefore, or both, excuse me, both of these quantities, they're Fourier transforms, that this same thing can be replaced instead of the Fourier transform of them being integrated. I can replace it by the convolution of the Fourier transform separately. Okay, so what this means, the the Fourier transform of the heavy side step function has this form here, which is pi times the delta function plus i omega, okay? I omega. So importantly, it's complex. Okay, now I can take this whole thing and I can write this as a convolution of from infinity to minus infinity in the frequency domain, zero omega prime. So it's the Fourier transform of the conducting piece there times, well, convolved with, excuse me, times blah, 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 pi times delta omega minus omega prime plus i over omega minus omega prime in this fashion, right? So I went from multiplying the two quantities in the time domain and taking their Fourier transform to now convolving the Fourier transforms of the two functions. Okay? And it doesn't look like I perhaps have done much, but the result of that is once you kind of work through, you take advantage of the delta function and solve for the conductivity itself, you get out this expression here, which is one over pi infinity to minus infinity d omega prime i sigma omega prime over omega minus omega prime. Okay, good. Now, what do we have? We have an integral of this conductivity function. It's a complex quantity with omega minus omega prime, an integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, but importantly, there's an i here. And so what you can see is the consequence of this integral is that let's say the real part of this thing depends upon the imaginary part of the output of this integral, okay, and vice versa for the imaginary part and the real part, right? And so ultimately, uh, using the fact that uh, one can write down that uh, this becomes there's this kind of consideration here where because of the, uh, the time domain signal is real, 
because the time domain signal is real, the conductivity is equal to the complex conjugate of the minus omega. Right, so the real part of conductivity in the frequency domain is an even function, and the odd part, uh, sorry, the imaginary part is an odd function, um, coming from the fact that time domain of the signal is real. Ultimately, we can write down here, we're almost at the end. that the real part of the conductivity can be written as an integral from 0 to infinity in this fashion, and sigma 2 can be written as minus 2 over pi integral infinity to 0 d omega prime sigma 1 omega prime over omega prime squared minus omega. Okay, now I went through all of this stuff, which uh, perhaps you might have learned in a different context in some uh, undergrad, say, mathematical physics class, um, because we use this all the time. So it's not just some kind of abstract and uh, formal mathematical exercise and coming as a consequence of, say, as it's typically derived, uh, analyticity in the complex plane. I prefer this derivation here because it, we start with the things in the time domain where there's this physical requirement of causality and don't ever have to take any integrals in the complex plane at all. But we come with the same point is that ultimately what we find is if let's say we had some experiment where we could measure, let's say, the dissipative part of the response the imaginary part of the conductivity. This tells us how much energy is actually used when we're doing a, we're putting a finite frequency uh, electromagnetic field in the system, then I can find the imaginary part of the conductivity and vice versa, okay? Very frequently we'll have some response function or say some response of the system, which uh, kind of has the real and the imaginary parts into it in some other kind of more complicated way. So we can use the real conductivity and the imaginary conductivity Together, let's say, import them into the Fresnel equations to figure out the reflection coefficient of some material. Generally, when we measure reflection from a sample, we want to, it's going to be a number. It's going to be a good reflector or a bad reflector, and this is going to be a frequency-dependent quantity. If I measure the reflection, I can't learn necessarily about what I really want to know is the complex conductivity, but I, and I want to know, let's say, a complex conductivity, which is a vector quantity, but I'm just measuring the scalar quantity, which is, let's say, the reflection coefficient. I can't figure out what the complex conductivity is unless I know the reflected wave's phase at the same time. So how the heck can I do that? Well, there's a kramers kronig relation. If I know the reflection coefficient for all frequencies, I can get the reflected phase's wave, and then I can go ahead and apply Fresnel equations. So this kind of thing is done all of the time. We're going to use it. We use it all the time in fitting response functions. We're going to fit to the complex conductivity here and make some physical arguments um, about the fact that the real parts, real and imaginary parts are related to each other. We can use it to infer, let's say, the superfluid stiffness of a superconductor for measuring the finite frequency measurement, doing a finite frequency measurement. So we can know what's the phase stiffness of a superconductor. We're going to talk about that, how much strength is in the delta function the conductivity delta function at zero frequency for measuring at finite frequency. Okay, so this kind of thing is going to happen all of the time, and we're also going to use it for um, for, for various kinds of sum rules that uh, that are important to our analysis as well. Uh, for the sigma one equation, uh, why do you have this omega prime in, in sigma one but not in omega? Oh, oh I think because I, I think I made a mistake. There's an omega out front here. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, in that case, the unit's right. Um, I, I don't want to go through the algebra. You, 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 with the assumption that this is true here, you can go from this integral, which is minus infinity to plus infinity, from zero to infinity. And uh, you know, when we do an experiment, we're not measuring negative frequencies, at least not explicitly. And so, uh, so that's why these are the experimentally useful quantities, because they go from zero to, to positive infinity. Okay, and now the units are all right. There's an omega prime here, and then there's an omega here. The integral is over omega prime. Okay? Good. Uh, any other questions? No? Okay, uh, so, so the discussion that I've given here 
uh, both starting from complete generalities through a little bit more specific aspects of talking about things like the conductivity and the kramers kronig relations, which we're going to use. Uh, these are you know, completely general things um, and uh, kind of independent of any particular mechanism that might lead to some particular kind of conductivity. Um, of course, many different things can lead to conductivity, and different materials have different possibilities. And so here's just a complete cartoon of the kinds of things that might lead to conductivity in a material that we might want to calculate in various different ways. And so you can imagine some very, very simple system, which has, for instance, some band structure that looks like this. And uh, because we're only interested in direct transitions, the momentum of the system, again, of the, of the light involved is very, very small as compared to lattice scales, or putting it differently, the wavelengths are very large as compared to lattice scales. We're only going to be concerned with direct transitions. So you can imagine, let's say, some generic metal, which has a chemical potential here. It leads to a bunch of direct transitions. And at some frequency, this leads to some absorption. And you have some kind of you know, big blob of conductivity as such. Okay? You can also imagine in a system, let's say, which breaks translational symmetry very weakly, that you're getting excitations right around the Fermi energy. And that's going to be kind of your conventional metallic transport. And that's going to give you some kind of peak, let's say, at the lowest frequencies. Now, on top of that, you can imagine other things going along. Imagine if you have uh, you know, some material like uh, table salt, sodium chloride, and there's sodium ions and chlorine ions, and they both have, they both have um, uh, charges on them. And you apply a time-varying electric field, and the sodium chlorine atoms can move with respect to each other. So this is some kind of lattice mode. It's an optical phonon. And here you can imagine getting very, very intense absorptions at some finite frequencies that correspond to the phonons of the system, the optical absorptions of the phonons. So much of the rest of the talk is all going to be about kind of understanding, you know, this is just a very schematic model, but understanding specific realizations of this. Okay. Any comments, questions? Okay, good. So let's talk about the simplest possible model to understand the electromagnetic absorption of light with, uh, with uh, electrons in a solid. Um, it's embarrassingly simple. It's the Druda model, and uh, we only use it and are going to discuss it because it turns out to be incredibly useful for understanding the basics of what we're going to learn in much more complicated systems. So we start with some equation of motion, and we write something like this here. Okay, so really what we're imagining here is it's just Newton's second law, F equals MA. Here's the uh, MA. We have an electric field that's pushing on the charges, and here is some kind of dissipative term. And in the Druda model, the simplest thing is done. Uh, MX dot is just the momentum. And so what this term is formally is the rate that momentum leaves the system. Right? So we just, they just put in a phenomenological term that removes the momentum at some kind of rate tau. Right? So what does one do with some kind of thing like this? You just assume simple harmonic motion, or harmonic motion, I should say, for both position and electric field. Right? We take that. We substitute it into here. We can, uh, let's solve this guy for the um, first derivative of, uh, let's say, the, the time dependence of this x0 term. And then one gets um, okay, something very simple like that. So I have, this is a velocity. It makes sense if uh, that's tau. That's the mass. That's the electric field. It's complex. That's uh, I omega tau there. And uh, if you recall my definition of conductivity, it was that the conductivity is equal to, there's the proportionality between electric field and the current. And so since the current, we can write it as the density of carriers times the electronic charge times their velocity, we write down J0 Ne squared tau over m times 1 over 1i minus omega tau. And then 
the conductivity is just inferring what the con conductivity sigma is from those expressions, and you squared tau over m, one over one minus i omega tau, or writing it a little bit differently, any squared tau over m times one plus i omega tau over one plus omega squared tau squared. Okay, so uh, embarrassingly simple. Uh, this model derived by Druda in 1900, which of course is uh, is wrong in all possible aspects as applied to little quantum mechanical particles like electrons. Um, uh, give, you get, when you do a, a, a more quantum mechanical calculation, which we're going to do in a little bit, uh, you get exactly the same result, which is why we use very frequently the classical model to describe um, uh, many different conducting systems. So this is what comes out here. This is a plot of the conductivity versus the log of the frequency. There is a real and imaginary part to it. So at the lowest frequencies, let's say the real part is the only thing that exists. The imaginary part is completely suppressed. As you go to higher and higher frequencies, then eventually at the scattering rate itself, one over tau, you cross over and the imaginary part becomes larger here. One important thing to note is the kinds of physical information that are available here. In principle, if you could imagine measuring the real part of the conduct, real and imaginary parts of the conductivity at low frequencies, you have access to this kind of important material information that otherwise you wouldn't. You can measure tau, the scattering time. Uh, if you know the density, you can separate out the difference. If you know the density of carriers, you can find out their mass. Um, you can find out in the relative size of the real and imaginary parts tau here and from the frequency dependence. And the amazing thing is that in the <coughs> simple conducting cases, this very, very simple derivation works amazingly well. So this is time domain terror spectroscopy of n-type doped gallium nitride. So just a very, very simple semiconductor. The dots are experimental data measured in, you can see in the sub terahertz range, and that's the real and imaginary parts of the conductivity fit the data exquisitely well. Um, one important thing to note is, again, and one of the reasons why we start with the Druda model is it kind of gives you a feeling for response functions. Uh, many students, when they're first kind of encountering spectroscopies that give you complex response functions, want to kind of throw away the imaginary part because it's kind of some, something extra. It's, it's imaginary, after all. But um, uh, it's not. It's the imaginary part is real. Uh, not, I don't want to confuse you. You know what, I'm, I'm making a joke. Uh, but the point is, is that there is very, very important information in both the real and imaginary parts. As we're going to talk about in the case of superconductors, it's actually the imaginary part of the conductivity which has all the interest, most of the interesting information in it, and the thing that we can really, we can really measure, if you will. Um, the, real, the relative sizes of the real and the imaginary parts tell us something about the relative scattering rate, and if you... Uh, kind of, if you will, by inspection of this term here and realizing that the imaginary part gets larger than the real part at some particular characteristic frequency, that's one over tau itself. Okay? So just by from inspection from these plots, I can figure out what is the scattering time of an electron as it, say, moves in, moves in some particular material. Um, there is, this is a simulation of the drive, that's a driving electric field at the bottom there at different values of omega tau. And so just to say a simple charged particle moving in a time-dependent electric field. And you can see as the frequency gets larger and larger and larger, two things happen. One, there's a phase lag at higher frequencies because of the mass of the particle. It has a hard time following the driving field. The other thing is that the amplitude gets much smaller. Right? The conductivity is smaller. And again, coming back, let's say, to this expression here, the conductivity is the proportionality with the current, and you can see that uh, the imaginary part gets larger, but both are getting smaller together, right? So that means the amplitude of the, the amplitude of the, the velocity, and hence the amplitude of the net excursion of the of the charge, classical excursion of the charge is getting smaller and smaller. 
Now, what else can we do with it? Let's look at, these are super simple systems. Let's look at a more complicated system. So this is some experiments that we did some years ago on a material which is called cerium copper 2 germanium 2. It is cerium copper 2 germanium 2. It's a heavy fermion material. Okay, so it's a complicated heavy fermion material. It has a magnetic transition as well as a regime where it uh, has this interaction of the electrons with localized magnetic moments. This interaction of the electrons with the localized magnetic moments leads to renormalization of the charge carriers to an effective change or the change in their effective parameters. And so their masses become very, very large. So this is a remarkable thing. You have this very strong interaction, but the consequence of that interaction is not to destroy let's say this Druda-like, or we might say Boltzmann transport regime altogether, but it's just to, if you will, change parameters far beyond their domain of kind of the non-interacting perspective, but it doesn't render those parameters completely meaningless, okay? And so, so that's what happens here. This is a plot of the conductivity of the material as a function of frequency at some very low temperature in the regi re regime where the masses have already become large, okay? The form of the optical conductivity is very, very different than the one that I was just showing you. Again, there's a real and imaginary part. Uh, you can see that the real part is, in fact, always above the imaginary part. And this call comes from a number of different reasons. It happens from the fact that at high temperatures, the masses of these charge carriers are, are kind of conventional. They're two or three times the free electron values. But at low temperatures, this renormalization effect. And what ends up happening is that the mass of the charge carriers, which we can infer from the shape and the size of this peak here, becomes very, very enhanced. And so in some free elect some heavy fermion systems, these masses become, let's say, of order of about 1,000 times the free electron mass. These are only of order of about 80 times the free electron mass, but that's still you know, quite a quite remarkable uh, enhancement that happens in a very, very small energy range. Now, you can see a number of different interesting things happen. At low temperatures, the mass turns on. But it also, we can measure what is, we're going to come back to this point. We can actually measure or quantify what's what we know as the frequency-dependent effective mass. And so at low frequencies, the mass is large. But as we go to higher and higher frequencies, the mass recovers to some value which is not enhanced. So this is some uh, interesting aspect of heavy fermion systems, and there's this kind of, if you will, uh, correspondence between frequency and temperature and in the, in the rough scale here that at the lowest temperatures, if we increase frequency, we can see the non-interacting, or let's say weakly interacting system, and if we increase, what did I say, increase temperature, we can see the weakly interacting or, or, uh, or uh, yeah, weakly interacting system, or if we increase frequencies, we get the same thing, and then by increasing frequency, we also come back to this non-interacting limit, which is reflected in the kind of non-trivial behavior of the, of the spectroscopic, let's say, shapes of the optical conductivity. Um, it's not Druda-like, but the Druda model is still kind of a starting point for our intuition of understanding what's in these spectra at all. And so this is why you know, I spend some time on it. Uh, in some very simple systems, it's applicable, but in other systems, it's kind of our, our, our first moment, our first, our first guess for kind of trying to understand physical behavior. Okay, um, here's another example of, of similar data from, let's say, so from some other groups. And uh, what is plotted here is the mass from optics versus the heat capacity. Heat capacity at zero, let's say in the limit of low temperatures, is sensitive to the density of states. Density of states is proportional to the mass. And so this plot here is really a remarkable demonstration of the quasi-particle concept. The idea that you can have very, very strong interactions, but a consequence of these strong interactions is not to break down the non-interacting or quasi-free interacting particle description altogether. It's just to strongly renormalize their parameters. These are two different experiments done. The heat capacity experiment is done in a fashion where one goes and looks to see how much energy is absorbed from the outside system to cause some kind of corresponding change in temperature. Right, thermodynamic experiment. The vertical axis, that data is generated by a dynamical experiment where you're really doing, you know, in some sense, the same experiment that the little kid does when he's shaking this box, trying to figure out what, pre what the present inside. Is it heavy or is it light? And it's really a remarkable uh, demonstration, again, of this quasi-particle concept that these, obviously there's some scatter here, but there's a rough correspondence. If you assume 
You know that unit cells and materials are generally all the same size, and there's approximately one electron that's contributing the conductivity per unit cell. Then uh, this kind of rough correspondence here shows indeed that you know things that are very very heavy have a heat capacity which is very large, and there's this kind of linear scaling in this fashion. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, all right. Now um, for insulators which uh, we're going to talk about also. Um, we can gain additional insight, but still not moving beyond the classical model by adding some restoring force. And let me also do what you're never supposed to do in a, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to re rewrite it. They tell you in, Lecturing 101, never to write on top of the blackboard where you've already written. People just get confused. So that's what I'm going to do. So we're going to start over. Um, so this is everything that I had put in so far. And now I'm adding an extra term here, which is just Hooke's law minus kx. This is the force involved. And really, the model now is nothing more than mass of a spring. Right? Um, we can define a few different uh, frequency scales out of this, and this ends up being convenient to uh, write what's going to come next. So we're going to de define a new frequency scale, omega 0, which is k over m. And we go ahead and we substitute in these kinds of onsatz for the, conduct for the position of the particle, the time-dependent electric field. We get basically going in exactly the same fashion. We get this expression here, n e squared tau. Oh, sorry, n e squared over m times omega over i times omega minus uh, omega uh, omega zero squared minus omega squared plus omega over tau. Okay, and that's just a model for a harmonic oscillator, right? So that's the conductivity there. Uh, it's got a big peak at the resonance frequency. And there's a real part in the imaginary part. And you can see the imaginary part has all this important structure that we might be interested in. If I let k, the spring constant, go to 0, this peak at finite frequency would move all the way down. and would eventually become the Druda peak. Okay. Now, um, uh, one might ask, uh, what's the whole, again, what's the point of looking at these kinds of simple, simple models? Um, we call this the Druda Lorentz model, by the way, when we add the, the restoring force on it. Uh, a model of a simple harmonic oscillator makes sense, at least intuitively, if we're talking about things like, say, like the phonons in the system, the lattice vibrations of the system, right? because this is something almost like a phonon. Um, but the Druda Lorentz model has far more applicability than that, and this comes back to the point that I made about the Kramers Kronig relations. So if you recall the kramers kronig relations, they're essentially a linear relation. It's an integral relation, but it's a linear relation, let's say, between the imaginary conductivity, integral of the imaginary conductivity with some other stuff, equaling the real conductivity, or integral of the real conductivity equaling the imaginary conductivity after taking this integral. Right? So what it means is, in terms of modeling spectra, it's wonderful if one has a real model where you can model spectra and look at something with it. But in terms of emulating spectra, you could always do it with some, if you, depending upon how accurately you want to do it, with enough finite frequency oscillators. So if I have some experiment where I measure the optical conductivity, I can go and emulate it with some, let's say, thousand different finite frequency oscillators. And the kramers kronig relations, because they're linear, that just automatically outputs the correct imaginary part of the conductivity. Okay? And so this kind of fitting routine is used for generating optical let's say, analysis of optical conductivity data, again, all the time. OK, uh, how much more time do I have? I have about 20 minutes. Um, all right, so there's a number of different derivations of, of, um, of uh, more complicated versions of this stuff that is uh, kind of approaching it from purely quantum mechanical perspective. But on the basis of time, I don't want to work out these derivations. I'm going to kind of just quote, I'm going to put starting points and results, and the details of which you can look up in these notes that I uh, that are online in the archive. 
So, um, so uh, a quantum description of this, kind of the simplest <coughs> description here, starts from Fermi's golden rule. And one might write down that, uh, let's say, the transition probability to go from one state to another in this fashion is just Okay, so that's just normal Fermi's golden rule. Um, to apply this to electromagnetic absorption, then uh, we need to know what the interaction Hamiltonian is. And typically, what we do with this is uh, we, uh, we substitute in uh, some form which we typically will write down in the transverse, say, in the Coulomb gauge, which is, then means the Coulomb, the electromagnetic field is purely transverse. E over mc times the integral, uh, oh, sorry, sum i to n, p sub i dot a r sub i in terms of the vector potential in this fashion. Um, I don't want to go through all of the math of this, but you take this guy here, which is the interaction, which is the, this is the dot product of the electron momentum with the vector potential of the electromagnetic field. You go through this in a fashion that, uh, is all detailed in my notes and come out in the end with an expression which reads I'm going to keep the Q dependence here for now. So the sum over states. 1 over h bar omega, integral dt, this is, excuse me. Okay, so this here, which I'm sorry how I've written it, uh, but I wanted to keep the conductivity to the far side to show you what everything that, um, that it was equaling is a expectation value of this current, current correlation function. Okay, it has the form expected that comes out of some kind of response function and stuff that uh, uh, essentially uh, appeals to the fluctuation dissipation theorem. It has, again, the form of this correlation function, which is here current current, and averaged over all states in this fashion. This is, I should have written it, it's this for the real part of the conductivity, and we, if we evaluate this, we can get the imaginary part through the kramers koenig relations. Okay? Now, um, if you go ahead and you assume, for, for instance, keep going with the calculation, and you assume that the spatial dependence, sorry, the time dependence of this has a form which <coughs> this particular form here, so the correlations are exponential. I'm sorry, nobody can see that right now, can you? Which one can they rewrite it? Uh, push the board over. Thank you. Okay, so if I take this expression here and I substitute it in and I continue the calculation, the thing that comes out of this, which is purely quantum mechanical calculation, is the dr model for the Druda, the, say the Druda model expression, exactly that. Okay, This is why, even though, again, we're going to be dealing with very quantum mechanical particles, and we typically are, um, the Druda model, this classical model, is still a good starting point for it, because the quantum mechanical calculation, let's say the first term in it, is completely reproduced by kind of the semi-classical approximation. And in fact, this is why this whole scheme of Boltzmann transport and say applied to uh, electrons moving in solids works at all. There's a whole huge field of, uh, of uh, 
people trying to calculate, you know, the next terms in this, and this is referred to generically as quantum correction. Right. There, was a, there was a question here. Yeah, I'm just a little confused where this this equation, for some reason it feels like probably because of the Kubo Green work that that should be a commutator, but it's just the... Uh, should it be commutator? I think the commutator will be the input frequency. <coughs> What's that? If it makes you... So I don't think it's the commutator. It's just this this expectation of this current current. Okay. So um, all right. So the point is that one can get the Druda model just directly out of this when. Uh, uh, or what is essentially equivalent to the Druda model, which is why this is uh, typically a good starting point, and why all of these uh, overly simplified classical models have had, let's say, such uh, such longevity. A, um, if you have, you're dealing with particles where there's Fermi statistics, then you can take the Kubo formalism and write down an expression which is called the Kubo Greenwood. And this is particularly used in cases where you're dealing with things, let's say, like uh, inner band transitions. So it's pi e squared over m star omega, 2 over 2 pi to the third. And then we have this guy here, s prime, momentum operator. And uh, some kind of, if you will, um, joint density of states. Okay, so this is this is Kubo, so-called Kubo Greenwood. And if it applies, if say like the Fermi statistics apply, so there's some occupied states and some unoccupied states, and you're looking at transitions between them. Okay. So, yeah. Quick question. So, by J star, maybe you said it and I missed it. J star is like J at like Q is to minus Q, essentially? Yeah. We're going to generally be worried about the Q equals zero limit of this, but, but, uh, but yeah, that's right. Okay, so. Um, okay, so this is some experimental data. This is optical absorption of carbon nanotubes. Now, coming back to this uh, expression here, a moment. What this is is again the optical absorption. It has the form of some matrix element times the joint density of states. Okay. Now, very frequently, if you really want to calculate the optical conductivity, you have to worry about this matrix element. But very frequently, in looking at optical conductivity experiments, we are more concerned with the joint density of states. And so, this is the optical absorption of a bunch of carbon nanotubes, and you can see that there's a bunch of peaks here. And these are formed at the Van Hove singularities in the density of states. So there are various places where the joint density of states peaks. And you can go ahead, and this is just really a very, very simple experiment with just some, op some carbon nanotubes spun on a piece of glass and looking at the optical absorption through it. And all of these very, very distinct peaks come out that then can be traced back to actual aspects of the band structure of the material. Okay, so very, very simple experiment that actually can tell you then, you don't see, you know, it's not like doing an angle result photo emission experiment where you really can just see some band structure itself before you, but you can't do optical uh, good uh, uh, angle result photo mixture experiment on some conglomeration of carbon nanotubes either. On this experiment, it's really just a very simple one where then you can see these peaks which form at the uh, peaks in the joint density of states. There's another experiment which I think is the particularly beautiful uh, demonstration of this, and this is transmission through graphene. Right, so this is just the transmission itself, which again comes from this particular expression here. Let's say we can take the optical conductivity of graphene, and from that, from the Fresnel equations, we can calculate the transmission. And when you do that through a single sheet of graphene, what you find is, is that through a single sheet of graphene, that the transmission is 1, 100% graph transmission, minus pi e squared h bar over c, or in other language, pi alpha. Okay. So if I take a single sheet of graphene and I shine light through it, the transmission through it is 1 minus pi alpha, where alpha is the fine structure constant. Okay, so how can this be? Well, it comes as a consequence 
of this expression here. Okay? So the, um, the joint density of states of, so if you can imagine in graphene, we're looking at these intervan transitions. Right? <coughs> so imagine we have some chemical potential of graphene which goes right through the Dirac point. And if I imagine larger and larger energies, which are kind of connecting occupied states to unoccupied states, I can imagine this kind of expanding circle getting larger and larger and larger as I connect occupied states to unoccupied states. And so the density of states is going up linearly in energy, linearly in frequency. Okay? So it turns out then that the dipole matrix element is decreasing as one over omega. And then with some other kinds of factors that come in for the transmission, you have cancellation of all of these kinds of non-universal factors like, well, the frequency itself, the Fermi velocity, so the velocity of the linear dispersion of graphene is also canceling. And the end result is a cancellation of everything except for these kinds of universal numbers, which can be reduced to the fine structure constant itself. So this is an experiment from Geim's group, and what you can see here, this is the transmission through graphene as a function of a number of different layers. And you can see that it all falls right in a straight line with a slope which is set by pi alpha, where alpha is the fine structure constant. So it's really kind of, we're used to, we, we know we can measure fundamental constants of nature in different contexts. We, uh, Gil earlier talked about uh, the quantum Hall effect, where you can measure in, the, in a non-dissipative response. But here you can actually measure these fundamental constants of nature in this dissipative response. Okay, we're gonna talk more about universal response functions in, uh, in, in my lecture tomorrow. Um, again, the thing that I wanna point out is that, uh, that this kind of unique behavior is really the cancellation of two things. It's this increasing function of the density of states and uh, inc increasing as a function of frequency of the density of states and the decrease of the, the dipole matrix element it leads to this kind of universal behavior and this cancellation. Okay, I have what, about uh, five minutes left? Okay, great. Okay, good. So um, let's go on and talk a little bit more about uh, different techniques. Now, um, one of the first points I made was that in when you're doing optical measurements of solids, that you have just this ridiculously large range of frequencies that you might be interested in, which then leads to many different possible techniques that you might uh, need to use. Right? High frequencies for uh, even up to the X-ray regime for characterizing various aspects of chemical bonding, all the way down to, in principle, microwaves and radio frequencies for characterizing very, very low frequency and uh, uh, low energy phenomena. And so then this means that one has to kind of, if you will, at least maybe not do all of these experiments in your laboratory, but at the very least appreciate them. So uh, one particular kind of experiment to do low frequency measurements is microwave cavity measurements. And so what is done in such an experiment is one has a metallic box of either high conductivity metal like copper or better it would be a superconducting resonator. So uh, let's say in this case is a cylindrical, uh, cylindrical box and you would take this, this uh, for ones that we actually do, experiments we do in my laboratory, this is about, a, is about one centimeter wide and it has a particular resonance frequency inside of about 20 gigahertz. So um, this is, you can imagine, for instance, this is an exploded view of it, but you can imagine that this lid goes on and then forms this kind of closed box. You take microwaves and you propagate them in through one hole, and if the microwaves are resonant with the particular size of this cavity, let's say we can set up a standing wave inside of electromagnetic fields, electric and magnetic fields together. We set up a standing wave inside, and microwaves can go in through one hole, and then they can come out through the other. So what we do in this experiment is we get, let's say, we scan the frequency and you know, we're way off the resonance frequency of the system. Nothing becomes transmitted through. But when we hit resonance, we get transmission through this box and out the other side. Right? So microwaves can come in through here and they go out through there. And we would be scanning frequency and we get this sharp resonance, which is a transmission through this structure. Okay? Then what we do is we open up the box, we put a sample inside, and we do the experiment again. And what finds is that the resonance shifts and let's say it broadens. And from the shifting and broadening, you can figure out what the conductivity is at one particular frequency. So this is a very kind of, the, the general idea is a very uh, generic one. It's used in many different experiments where you want to do a resonance, a resonant experiment in this fashion. But it's very, very sensitive 
And, uh, but the advantage, or the, the, the advantage is it's very sensitive, but the disadvantage is that it only works at a particular single frequency, which is the resonance of this microwave cavity itself. Okay. So kind of experiment that, uh, that my group has uh, worked on in recent years, uh, which is, has some difficulties in the sense that it's not as sensitive because it's not resonant, but it's far more powerful because you can really do experiments at low frequency over a broad frequency range. This is what we call the Corbino microwave spectroscopy. And what happens in such experiment is that you have a device called a network analyzer. A network analyzer is a device, let's say, used by electrical engineers to analyze things like a, um, uh, an amplifier circuit in a cell phone tower. So your cellular phone has a particular signal. It goes to a cell phone tower, and that signal becomes amplified. So if you want to build a microwave amplifier, then you better have a network analyzer that understand that can characterize how this circuit particularly works. So we use it in a very different fashion. So the microwaves come out of the network analyzer, go down to the sample. A sample sits at the bottom down here, cold, and then the microwaves reflect off the sample and go back to the network analyzer. Sounds simple enough. This reflection, you can actually measure the complex reflection coefficient. And in principle, we can work out what the properties of the sample are. The difficulty with this is that those microwaves come down from the network analyzer. And let's say there's going to be some connectors. And these connectors are made to pass microwaves, but the connectors are not perfect. And plus, we're putting them at low temperatures. So the microwaves, let's say, come down, hit a connector, and some of the microwaves reflect off that connector and go back to the network analyzer without having ever, inter ever interact with the sample. Some microwaves continue on down to the sample, reflect off the sample, and go back up, but they hit that connector from the backside and they go back to the sample, and it's a big mess. Fortunately, the way to work out this mess was figured out uh, 150 years ago by people sending telegraph signals from New York to San Francisco. If you wanna talk about a messy, noisy transmission line, that was certainly one, and they figured out that if you would do three calibration experiments, all of this mess of all the possible losses and multiple ways that things can be reflected around can ultimately be removed, and you can get out very, very crisp, clean data. So um, experiments that were done, these were done in Stuttgart by, uh, by Mark Shuffler, not by my group. This was, again, done on a heavy fermion material. And so what the interesting part about this is it's a heavy fermion, but you can see that it actually, at low frequencies, the experiments I was showing you before were going up to a few hundred gigahertz. This guy here, it's on logarithmic scale, but it's only going, this is 10 gigahertz. So it's very, very low frequencies. These guys cross at about you know, one, two, three gigahertz or something like that. So you can infer the scattering rate. Okay. So the scattering rate here is incredibly low, very, very low. And the reason for that is the mass renormalization. And so again, the Druna model is a good, this is a, I mean, it's sometimes a, a helpful uh, point that particularly in strongly interacting systems, we don't, to get some intuition about them, we don't necessarily need an exact solution for or a curve to fit your data, we need some kind of class of models which gives us some intuition about it. And even though the Druna model is an awful model in terms of anything, in terms of its microscopics, it gives us some way of kind of starting to approach the problem and seeing what's there. And so what do you see in the, in the context of this? This is the Druna model here, right, as written before. The only difference from what I've written before is that I put these stars on these various terms. And one of the things that you can see from this is that when you're writing it down in terms, we can write down the Druna model in a form of frequency dependent quantity here. This omega p is what we call the plasma frequency. But we're writing it here in terms of a frequency dependent plasma frequency. And this is a frequency dependent uh, relaxation time. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this in the next lecture. But this is what we call the extended Druna model when this has a frequency dependence. What comes in from this is that this incredibly narrow scattering rate, very, excuse me, low scattering rate, very narrow Druda features, is related to the mass enhancement okay, in a fashion that you can show. And so the fact that this Druda peak is so, so narrow, you know, like in a piece of copper, it might be a terahertz wide, but here it's three gigahertz wide, that's related directly to the mass enhancement of uranium platinum uh, aluminum three, or palladium to the aluminum three. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm out of time. I wanted to say a few more things about superconductors, but I think I'll come back to that in the, uh, in the terms of the Corbino measurements, but I'll come back to that in the, uh, the afternoon lectures. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.
other standing waves. You can set up higher frequency modes, which are then are standing in there, and, uh, and couple to those. And so it doesn't allow you a continuous spectroscopic response, but you can hit a few frequencies in the first something like this. So this is um, in there, it's kind of a little bit difficult to model with, because it typically is the case that only one of the resonant modes of the cavity is really super high quality factor. And so the other one is you, know, you kind of like get very good data at one frequency and poor data at, at a bunch of other frequencies. Um, I have heard of a few occasions where people have tried to tune the cavity in this fashion, but uh, it ends up being control the shape perfectly as, as, as well as it need to. Yeah, and also it it, um, it has to do a lot also with. Uh, the, I mean, I think that the, the, the major problem with it is that. Uh, Okay, so, so the two things that you want from the, so, um, so, so the thing that you meant, let's go to the data. So the, right, so the, the, the things that you want in this, the things you measure, or this, let's say, complex frequency shift. The resonance moves and it broadens. And from that, you can define a complex frequency shift. There's a real shift, and then the imaginary shift is the broad one. Right? And so what you want, though, is you want to know the complex conductivity. So how do you go from the complex frequency shift to the complex conductivity? You need a model for that. So what you need to know is really where the sample is in the cavity. And then uh, you need to know, is it being exposed to yeah, yeah, places right. where the electric field is maximum, the magnetic field is a minimum in a standing wave. So in a traveling wave, that's not the case, but in a standing wave, the electric field is max, the magnetic field is minimum, vice versa. So you really have to place the sample exactly in the right place. So to place the sample exactly right in the middle, to be able to model it well, to know what those coefficients to go from the, the frequency shift to the conductivity. So if I move the sample, if I change the size of the cavity, then I also have to move the sample in the cavity. But it's difficult to keep it exactly in the right place in the same part of the cavity. So we have these kinds of like, typically in most experiments, we'll have these kind of like, we can, we can model things, let's say, to within 20% of getting out. What these experiments do very well is give you like a quantity proportional to the conductivity. But to give you exactly the conductivity, you need to know all of these coefficients in front very accurately. And so the problem is when you start changing the size of the box, uh, then you don't know those coefficients very accurately. So let me put it like that. So, you know, if, we have, if, I, if I care, you know, if I'm doing a measurement at 20 gigahertz, and let's say I measure the, twi the, the temperature points, and I see, you know, some particular interesting shape as I go through some particular transition, I may not care if I, if I know the conductivity to within some normalizing factor of, that's as an error on it of 20%. Because I know the temperature, I know the shape of the temperature dimensions very well. I may not know this prefactor very well. But if I want to know, um, but if I want to do like some real spectroscopic experiment, I need to know how to weight different frequencies with respect to each other. And that those coefficients are different for each one. So it's so then it, it becomes very hard to do that. So people have tried to extract that, but it's and I've tried to do it, but it's uh, let's say limited uh, I think a limited utility. Yeah, because the scope of is What's that? The, the dependence of your, your sample, or the, the results you get on the position of the sample, um, does that also, um, do you think, start caring about the shape of your sample? Yeah, and the, yeah very much. That's important as well. So uh, that comes in. Yeah, it's surprising that you have to know the depolarization factor, because you need to actually model what the electromagnetic fields are inside. There's a way of dealing with all of that. So it sample is absoidal in geometry, and all of this kind of complications can typically be replaced by just a single number. Uh, again, it goes into this prefactor in front. 
probably do need to do a sample shape of the yeah, as well. And so typically what we'll try to do is uh, we'll put the sample as a plate. This is the easiest geometry. Some people have actually worked on spheres, which is uh, a case where the depolarization factor is known very well. But sometimes people will work <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. on a plate geometry yeah, where the depolarization right. factor would take and to be zero and put it right smack dab in the middle where the electric field is zero, but the magnetic field is maximum. And so you then you have this plate and the magnetic field is kind of oscillating in time up and down, up and down, up and down. And uh, that time dependent uh, magnetic field is then causing electric fields to go, let's say, around like this, causing, let's say, dissipation of the sound. Um, and, um, even then, there's some small errors that come in because the plate is imperfectly represented as a flat ellipsoid, which is what you're doing here. Are you guys uh, looking at? Uh, There's so much that goes into this, uh, well, uh, which is why, in the end, you might know uh, uh, why you can know uh, well, temperature dependence model, quite well. Like, so, for instance, what people uh, do to, with this technique uh, is uh, looking at uh, dynamical to they'll measure so like interesting localization. <laughs> they send it to as a function yeah. of temperature lock file, mm -hmm. uh, and this uh, in a uh, let's say like in a D wave superconductor. Mm -hmm. The, this thing will come in a clean D-wave superconductor. Realize that. It's proportional. This the imaginary part of the conductivity yeah. is proportional yeah. to T. Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't care yeah. that yeah. if I'm measuring yeah. this, I can learn yeah, the superconductor because, yeah. because I get yeah. a proportional yeah. that's, uh, yeah. that's, uh, that's sensitive yeah. to T. But I don't uh, care necessarily yeah. what the exact yeah. proportionality yeah. factor is yeah. for sigma two. So if sigma two has a function of temperature, let's say plus or minus twenty percent. But the twenty percent is is a fixed number. It's all for all of them. There's some coefficient. Well, that means basically NMR, right? NMR. right. right. Like but I can get very similar types. Yeah. Yeah. So the temperature um, balance, then I can learn that there are unique D wave nodes. Um, right. You get a lot of D wave super rays. So you get like four vibrations for the, 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 the advantage. Mm -hmm. um, so and the size of your sample is also I mean, like, you don't you want it to be smaller than a wavelength? Well, the wavelength is in the cavity. The, the wavelength is approximately the size of the cavity itself. Oh, okay. yeah. And yeah. so uh, you want the sample much smaller than that because we want to be in what's called the simulation perturbation regime. So the sample, you don't want to load up the cavity with a sample, which really changes the fundamental shapes of these standing waves. Right. So you just want it to be a small perturbation. Uh, it was actually for the electro the, the theory for this was uh, was first worked out. I mean, you can couple it to nuclear spins. We um, get into that. You can also have a guy who those are very easy to couple. Other we for yeah. uh, yeah. people have done that. Uh, um, we're more yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 So in World War Two, uh, they took all these brilliant guys, and some of them made atomic bombs, and some of them worked on radar. And uh, one of the problems that Schwinger worked yeah, out was a perturbation the theory for cavity. Okay. Yeah. So this is a like, really beautiful uh, set of lectures that come from the MIT radiation lab. Yeah, which yeah, we started exactly. to develop. It's, 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 it's a little start to develop uh, radar. Uh, and it's and, uh, direct, he basically worked out this whole perturbation scheme for cavities. Yeah. Uh, the NV is the only thing that's optically active. What? The pick-up loop? Or? Yeah, yeah. Are you a student here? No. Where, where did you say your student where? You, uh, UCCR. Uh, UCCR. Uh, UCCR. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Alright, looking forward to your talk later. See you then. Good luck. How is it? You want to ask me something? Yeah, yeah. You can write lines even if you want. Oh, like, you guys write lines. Did you come to the school before? Uh, last year, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is this everyone's problem in the class or just a few of us?